We turn now to a remarkable story of hope and perseverance. Kwame Ajamu was just 17 years old when he was wrongfully convicted of murder back in 1975. The state's entire case was built on the testimony of one witness, who later said police pressured him to, the po to point the finger at Kwame. He spent 28 years behind bars, several of those years on death row, before being exonerated in 2014. Now that he's cleared his name, he's dedicated his life to helping others and abolishing the death penalty. I'm honored to have him here tonight to share his inspiring journey to freedom. Kwame Ajamu, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure and an honor Kwame, to be Kwame, you were just, uh, no, it is our honor, thank you. Um, you were just a kid. You were 17 years old um, when you were sentenced to death. You had no criminal history whatsoever, and yet here you were uh, falsely accused, convicted, and sentenced to die. Uh, what was happening in your life right up until that point, and how did you become a suspect to begin with? So, uh, typical, you know, juvenile things, uh, um, sports motivated was uh, my way of life, uh, playing chess, basketball, football in the neighborhood. And in fact, on the day of uh, the uh, crime, uh, which was May 19th, 1975, um, uh, myself and my friend Ricky Jackson were in fact playing basketball on the, on the time of the uh, uh, murder and robbery there in the city. Uh, but um, how we became um, selected, I like to say, uh, for that purpose uh, was really easily. Um, the city of Cleveland had been through uh, a number of series of uh, uh, racial discrimination since uh, 1966. And so they were really a cesspool, a uh, smeltering pot, if you will, of uh, people trying to adapt back into some type of uh, uh, societal normality. Uh, with um, having uh, had uh, black and white issues throughout the city in, in my um, youth growing up. Uh, certain parts of town we uh, couldn't go on because, you know, the Italians were there or the Polacks were there or, the, you know, the Puerto Ricans or whatever. So it, we, had, uh, we had those problems and it really was bad with uh, the uh, authorities. Uh, the police had a, a system at that time where they, they called uh, cleaning up the books. Uh, if they arrested someone on a charge, they would look to see if that charge that they arrested him for um, merit any other charge. And if so, then they would just give them all to him and clean up the books. So it was very easy for mm -hmm. these three little black kids um, to be charged with killing a white man uh, in the neighborhood at that particular time. Um, the fact that they had uh, a little 12-year-old black kid helping them was uh, just uh, an impossible thing for my mind to uh, uh, conceive based on the fact that, uh, you know, he was a neighborhood boy as well. Uh, went to school mm -hmm. with his sister and uh, the like. So, but uh, that's what happened and that's how it happened. And it was devastating to not only me uh, and my family, but my friend and his family as well. Yeah. Did you, okay, so this 12 year old boy, um, his name was Eddie Vernon. Did you know Eddie him? Vernon. Were you, were you guys, Okay, so you guys know, knew each other. Now, yeah. he was the only witness, he was the only witness that cops had, um, but as an adult, he, he lied in a hospital bed um, and confessed to his pastor, who had asked him, who had felt that you know there was something heavy weighing him down, uh, what really happened in 1975, and that you know he hadn't witnessed the murder, that he had falsely accused you and your brother and, and your friend of, of murder, and he said he tried to back out of that lie during a lineup, but police told him that it was too late to change his story. Did you ever get to meet Vernon as an adult in person? I did, and um, it was uh, briefly, um, you know, we spoke, and I told him uh, at the time that, uh, you know, I forgave him uh, as a child. You know, um, he was uh, 12, I was 17, so it's five years different, but we both were boys, we were children. And so I understood, um, you know, the childish thing of being uh, persecuted and, and vetted, you know, uh, in, in, uh, pitted, I'm sorry, in that uh, particular situation. Uh, as to why he did it uh, is really, uh, I, um, in some of my uh, lectures, uh, I speak with uh, the uh, young uh, adults in college, 
and I tell this particular part of my story over and over again that they might understand the confusion here as to why this happened. But this was a 12 year old boy who was a habitual liar and his, his family knew that. So when they did allow him to make that contact with his family, they told him uh, to straighten out his lies and, and come his butt home. Um, at that particular time, the authorities knew that his mother was suffering from ovarian cancer and that she subsequently died from that particular disease. Um, they, um, this is where the coercion came in. And uh, they um, leaned on him, they screamed at him, they slammed books and kicked chairs and cursed and told that 12 year old kid that if he did not continue to say what he had said originally when they brought him to the station, uh, that these boys that did it and he saw them do it, then they would go and arrest his mother and charge her with the perjury as he was too young wow. uh, to serve the five years in prison. And so this is why, and that, wow. that is the magnitude of, of how uh, th these dramatics happened in our life. This is, not only did that destroy, as I said, myself, my brother and my friend's life, but you had this 12 year old boy who had to go now the rest of his life um, as a villain. Uh, both to the, the society, his neighborhood and friends, and almost in his mother's eyes. You see, so this was uh, uh, an atrocity that should not have happened. And uh, later on, I'll tell you about some of the things that I'm doing to hopefully uh, stop it from happening in the future. Yes. So you're 17. Uh, you've been accused by an, a, a kid, essentially, um, who wanted to recant. Um, and prosecutors kept that, or police kept that away, that information away from your lawyers that he wanted to actually back out of this story. Um, and so your lawyers didn't know, and you've been now sentenced to death. How does a, mm -hmm. a kid so young begin to prepare themselves for life on death row? So there, there is no, no immediate preparation. Um, I'm sorry to say, um, this is one of those uh, uh, tragedies in life that unfolds minute by minute. And so uh, once I was sentenced at the, the uh, tender age of 17 um, to die, and then transported to uh, the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility uh, there in Lucasville, um, that's when the, the, the horror came. I'd like to say that uh, that was the chamber of horrors. And that's when um, the the torture, uh, the human torture, the mental uh, um, horrors uh, became reality in my life. Uh, at that point, uh, I was no longer 17, I was no longer a child, I was a man, and I had to defend my manhood and my pride and myself in order not to be a victim of which I had already been, but one who would lose his life mm -hmm. in this fight. Um, so in this cell, I could touch either wall and the ceiling. It was that mm -hmm. small or I was that big, one or the other. Um, but there was uh, no, no, no one to meet me, no one to greet me, no one to give me a hug. My mom wasn't there who I really missed, you know. Um, it was all bad. It was all sad and lonely. And um, for the first time ever, I did not have a concentrated effort uh, to maintain my thoughts from getting away from me. Um, instead, I relied on my abilities to observe what was around me and tell myself that I would not become victim of what I know now to be PTSD and how it uh, affects the human mind. As on my third day there, on death row, um, I learned how to play chess without a board uh, in my mind or by numbers, if with a board. And uh, I'm telling you this story, this part of the story, because the third day on death row, this goes uh, consequently to the question you asked me. Um, two men were playing chess on the upper deck and they were playing by numbers. And numerically, uh, one guy asked the other guy if he would put his bishop on his knight 47, which corresponded with this old man's cell that uh, was obviously suffering from PTSD. And um, he screamed for hours, for hours, for hours. Third day there, 
that was my initiation to death row and the learning of what post-traumatic stress was really about. More with Kwame and the incredible work he's doing after this short break. Kwame, you sit tight. There's more Making the Case. Welcome back to Making the Case. Still with me is Kwame Ajamu, who spent 28 years in prison, many of them living on death row for a crime he didn't commit. He was exonerated in 2014, and now he's fighting to abolish the death penalty once and for all. Kwame, uh, since being released, um, you've dedicated your life to helping others who have also been wrongfully convicted. You're now a board member, board chair member, that is, for the nonprofit Witness to Innocence. When did you decide that this was going to be the path your life would take um, to devote your life to justice reform? Actually, uh, <laughs> that happened on death row. Um, two things happened on death row. I, I became an adult. And uh, I decided that uh, what had happened to me was wrong and that I would hate it uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, there's an Islamic prophecy. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Wasallam said that when you run into an evil, try to stop it with your hands. And if you can't stop it with your hands, speak against it with your tongue. And if you can't speak against it with your tongue, hate it in your heart. That's the weakest of your faith. And that was where I was at at that particular mm -hmm. point. I couldn't do anything about it, but hate it. And so now that I was free and I searched and uh, Witness the Innocent actually found me, as did Ohioans to stop uh, executions. And uh, I became a member uh, based on the fact that I hated it in my heart. And I wanted to see uh, people live normal lives without fear of being tormented by their own government of being killed by their own government. America eats as young, they would say. And so that is why I became a, a, an outspoken member and a, and a, a general in the lead of this. And I, when I say general, I mean one who gets on the ground and marches and go from door to door, uh, peddling my product of witness to innocence. And that you should hear it, speaking to the youth, speaking to the schools, the elementaries, the universities, colleges and the like. Yeah. Here in Ohio, so I was going to ask you so uh, to talk about. So I was going to ask you to talk about your role um, at Witness to Innocence and, and the great work that you're doing there to help others who also have been wrongfully convicted. Tell me about that. Right. So Witness to Innocence is the only organization of its kind. You know that uh, we are owned, operated, and led by former death row exonerees like myself, all the way from me and then the board, all the way down. Uh, so what we do is dialogue around uh, the country, change laws. We have stopped saved executions. We had stopped got stays. We have stopped change laws. We are dialoguing in every country, in every city, in every town that we can get accepted in to abolish capital punishment, not only here in America, but throughout the entire world is our mission to stop capital punishment, to save lives and end the injustices of that country, of America eating its own. Witness the Innocence are a group of soldiers, nonprofit organizations who, with the will of their own selves and determinations based on their abilities and the fact that we too have suffered all of these atrocities of which we now fight against and want to not mm -hmm. see no one else suffer from them. This is what Witness the Innocence is about. Well, Jami, you mentioned that Ohio is seeking to abolish the death penalty, and you recently teamed up with local lawmakers there um, and faith leaders and other exonerees in order to um, to have the death penalty abolished there in Ohio. Tell us about those efforts. So here in the state of Ohio, I did. I teamed up with uh, Ohio wants to stop uh, executions and a slew of members and other organizations who want the same thing to happen. Um, and um, is led by state representatives, uh, Nikki Antonio and uh, Howard, um, uh, Steve Huffman, I'm sorry. And um, the bill is on the floor, it's pushing, it's been pushed by way more uh, uh, Protestants and uh, non-Protestants alike, by uh, socialists, by capitalists, by everybody you can think of is for ending capital punishment in the state of Ohio. And I do believe that it's going to happen real soon, real soon. 
Well, we're definitely going to be watching that closely, Ajamu, um, or Kwame, that is. I would love to have you back on the show. Please give us any updates on those efforts uh, there in Ohio. Thank no, you sir. so much for your time tonight and for all of the good work that you're doing. Wishing you all the best. Thank you.